All right, Genesis chapter 11. So just getting up to speed, of course, with where we're at in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. We had already seen Adam and Eve, and then Noah, and the flood, and now the flood is over. We're done with all of the, the flood chapters, and um, now we're, the people are starting to overspread the earth. And we had a genealogy back last week in chapter 10. We've got another little bit of, of genealogy here in, in chapter 11. But um, one of the first things we see here now that the people start to do is, um, you know, of course, this famous story of the Tower of Babel. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this this evening. The, uh, you know, in the, in the first verse, if you notice, it says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And this is going to be important. I'm going to get into to all this. So there's a lot to be learned from what happens here at the Tower of Babel. Yeah. There's, there's end times prophecy relations with the Tower of Babel. There's, there's all kinds of things. But look at this, just right on the surface, let's just see what, they, what they're doing. Um, it says in verse number 2, And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now remember, this is still when there's not that many people on the earth. This is very shortly after the flood. Within like the first hundred years, we're guessing, is, is when you know, all of this is taking place. So there's people, but there's not that many people. And, and they're all grouped together. They're all sticking together in one place, and they go to the land of Shinar, and they're dwelling there. And it says in verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city, and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they don't want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They want to work together. They want to stick in one place. And what do they start to do? They start to, to you know, build buildings, which is nothing wrong with building a building, but you know, they make their brick, they have their mortar, but they get it in their, in their hearts or in their minds that they want to build a tower that reaches unto heaven. Now, this is symbolic of a couple different things. One, it's symbolic of a works-based salvation, right? The only way that we can get to heaven is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always been by faith in God. We always need to rely on God's words. But what do they do? They get everybody together and say, you know what? We're going to build a tower. We'll do it ourselves. We don't need God. We're going we're to put our efforts together. We're going to collectivize. We're going to combine our, our efforts and our strengths. And we can do this. And we're going to build a tower that's going to reach all the way up to heaven. And that alone is wickedness going outside of, of God's... Um, will and outside of God's plan, but um, man, there, there's so much, there's so much packed in here, hopefully, I'm, I'm going to try not to keep it too late tonight, but there's a lot of things I want to go over, and um, I'm, getting, I'm getting way ahead of myself already, I'm excited to preach this chapter, um, let's, um, so on the surface here, we've got the, we've got their, um, their workspace salvation. They're trying to build a tower into heaven, right? And Mommy. but where are they at here? And this is kind of important to understand where, where all this stuff is taking place. Basically, here it says that that it was um, where is the word? They're in. They call the city Babel, right? That's the city that they. Made. They wanted to, they, they were, they were in this, the, this land, they, they said they traveled east from where the, where they had originally gotten off the ark. They traveled east, and they're in the land, and they're in the land of Shinar. Now, basically, Babel is the same place as Babylon. Later on, you're going you're gonna to see references to Babylon. Babel is the same place, and I could prove that to you from the Bible. And, and this is kind of interesting, because it says in... Mommy. Verse number 2 of Genesis 11, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then that's when they start to build this tower and everything else, and the name of the city is Babylon. In Daniel chapter 1, and you can turn there if you'd like. You don't have to turn these. There's a couple of references here. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Right, everyone? Nebuchadnezzar has, has a lot of... There's a lot of stories involving him. 
He was the king of Babylon, right? And he came and, and they're the ones that took the children of Israel out and brought them into bondage. You know, they, they brought them out of the land. And um, verse number two says, but so Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Verse number two says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. So when he went in and removed the children of Israel, he also took all the stuff from out of the, out of the temple. Right? Or almost all the, all the vessels, you know, they're made of gold or silver, they're real ornate. Nebuchadnezzar saw that stuff, and he's like, I want this stuff. So he brought it back to his temple for his God. But it says that he carried them into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. Oh, I'm just doing this to, to kind of show you some of the proof as Babel and Babylon being the same place. And, you know, we could see it directly from the Bible. Because he was a king of Babylon, and when he brought the stuff back, he went back to the land of Shinar. And then in 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 36, we see another reference here to Jehoiakim. In verse number 5, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Same thing, same story, it's just, it's just being uh, restated here. In Second Chronicles, and in uh, verse number seven says, Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon, and put them in his temple at Babylon. So in Daniel, he said he carried them to the land of Shinar, and then in verse seven of Second Chronicles, it says he brought them into Babylon. The Tower of Babel, Babel was established in the land of Shinar. It's the same place, and, and really, it, it, they sound almost you know Babel, Babylon. It's the it's the same place. And I just wanna, wanted to show that. You could prove that from the Bible in the same place by using these scriptures. Now, why am I going through all this effort to show you that is because what we're going to learn just from this passage in the Old Testament, um, there is knowledge here of end times prophecy as well. Because Babylon is referred to all throughout the Bible. Every time Babylon is mentioned, it's, like it's a negative reference. Babylon is never used as like a good place, right? Babylon is always wicked and evil, and especially in the book of Revelation, that's where the, the great whore, and we're going we're to look at some of that prophecy about Babylon, because we could, we could learn some, some good truths, and when we see the, uh, some of the characteristics at the Tower of Babel and what the people were doing, we're going to see the same characteristics that are going to happen right before Jesus comes back, too. So, um, if you want to turn to Revelation, go ahead and turn to Revelation. We're going to see a few of the references to Babylon in Revelation. We're going to start in Revelation 14, then we're going to look at Revelation 17. <laughs> Revelation 14, verse number 8. Revelation 14, we're just going to look at verse number 8, and then we're going to flip over to Revelation 17. Revelation 14, 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, notice that, because we're going to see this mentioned again. Babylon is, is this wicked city, and of course it's going to fall, it's going to be destroyed. And it says that the reason why Babylon is, is destroyed is because she made all nations. So that Babylon has a lot of influence, this, this future prophetic Babylon. Now, I don't necessarily believe it was that Babylon is talking about the literal, like, original place of Babylon, which was in, in current, uh, the country of Iraq, right? In Mesopotamia, that area. That's where Babel was. That's where the Chaldees were in that, in, that, in that whole area, that Mesopotamian region, okay? Just a little bit of geography. But um, when the prophetic Babylon is being spoken of, it's not necessarily talking about that same place. It's just referring to Babylon because, again, because of all of the other references we have throughout the Old Testament, because it was a, it was a, a worldwide kingdom, because, you know, there's a lot to learn um, and there's a reason why the Bible is using Babylon as the name. Um, and, and we're not going to spend too much time on all the prophecies regarding Babylon. We are going to look at the ones in Revelations. 
in Revelation. Um, so we see here that that city, that great city that, that, that is going to be destroyed, Babylon, um, made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So it's a, it's a, it's a wicked city that's promoting its own wickedness, um, its promiscuity, her fornication to all nations of the world. And look at Revelation 17, verse number 1. And we see a lot of attributes. Look at when you, when you look at this, you're going to see a lot of attributes that are very similar to the United States these days. Now, again, I'm not saying that the United States is Babylon either. I'm not making that claim. But when we're looking at this wicked city, and when we're looking at um, all the things that, that, are, that are said about it, we can't ignore the similarities that we can see within our own nation today. Now, we don't know when the, when the end times are going to be here. We don't know when the Antichrist is coming back. We don't know for sure. Now, it seems like these, these days are going to happen very soon. And a lot of people I know, we, we all kind of think, yeah, it's going to happen, you know, maybe in the next couple decades or something. I don't know, pretty soon. Could be sooner. Could be later. Don't know. But we can see the way things are going, right? And what I see when I read, and we're going to read Revelation 17, quite a few verses here, and, and try to notice and, and think about when it's talking about Babylon, and you're talking about this influence. Now, the first influence we saw here was making all nations drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Where is Hollywood located? It's in the United States, right? It's in California. And what do they produce? They produce movies that the whole world watches, right? Now, how many people in America, they don't, we don't, you know, generally people in America don't watch these other countries' films that they produce and stuff. But all, like, almost all the big hits that come out of Hollywood, they all get dubbed, they all get subtitled, they all get shipped overseas. And people go and watch that stuff. A lot. I mean, that's big. That, this is, like, the, the movie industry is, is worldwide that comes out of Hollywood. And what's coming out of Hollywood is trash. It's garbage. It's wickedness. It's fornication. It's adultery. It's all this sin that it glamorizes and glorifies and tries to desensitize you to and make you think that all this stuff is just fine and it's pure wickedness from the devil on the big screen. And it's, be, it's influencing all the nations of the world. All the nations' cultures are becoming more Western. Yeah. All of them are. As our society, as the whole world and earth... Uh, is, is, is advancing and, and we're, you know, this technology advances and the world becomes a smaller place and there's so much more information being spread and the media and the, the music and everything, this movies, all this whole, the impact that it's having is shaping the, the global culture to all be more wicked. You used to have all these different cultures from all over the world because people were more isolated within their own, within their own nation. And did their own thing. Well, now you could be on the other side of the world and see everything that that you know Hollywood's putting out, and the, the power they have behind that, just just the influence that they have in people's minds. And when you start to see things that happen on the on the big screen, you start to think those things are normal. I'll give you a good. I'll give you one example. And um, The, the reference escapes me right now, but I, I read this, that back in like the, oh, early, early movie days, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, there was, you know, the, the way that the women appeared on screen was a lot different than what your average woman looked like in society, in the culture. And I believe it's because there was a specific agenda. For example, you know, women didn't always walk around wearing pants. Is for all throughout history, it's very common for women to be in dresses and skirts and, and dressed like ladies. But when the movie industry started getting big and people started going to the picture shows, the 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 lead actors and actresses, well, they started dressing a certain way. You know, women start wearing pants, whatever, whatever it may be. Short haircuts, all these different things happen. It's a tack on the genders, on the male gender, on the female gender. And, and you know, the men start, you know, for a while they're pretty masculine. And now you see a movie today and they're just like sissies. 
There are no more, you know, at least back like 30 years ago, you have like the John Waynes and the Dirty Harrys and things like that, where you have like men who, who acted like a man who would be, you know, kind of tough and, and, and acted just manly in general, even if it was just worldly, but still like a man. Nowadays, you have all these sissies that, <laughs> that cry and just do all, you know, all this other stuff. It's an agenda. It's, it's, it's pushing people to think that this is normal. When you can take one film or a few films or whatever and, and put that in front of millions of people and they watch and everyone goes to see this. And then the next movie comes out, the next movie comes out, the next movie comes out. I mean, I, I haven't seen a, a, a Hollywood movie in years. I don't know. I mean, it's been, it's been a long time. But I'm, I, I'd be curious how many movies these days now are just having open sodomites just as part of the movie. As just a normal thing. That's just fine. You would never see that, you know, 15 years ago, or rarely. If it, was, if it, if it back 15 years ago, it was a shock. Or 20 years ago, even, man, it's 2015, right? Yeah, 20 years ago, like 1995, it would have been a shock to see something like that. And I remember some of the movies I saw back then that were shocking. And then later on, and and that's what they do. They put these things out. They desensitize you to that sin, and things just get worse and worse and worse. So. Anyway, that, that's my little rant about the movie thing. I want to get back to, to Revelation here. Look at Revelation 17. My point is, look at some of the things that, it, when it talks about Babylon, that might be able to be applied to our country today. And if, again, regardless of whether or not it's talking about the United States being Babylon, doesn't matter. We don't want to be anywhere closely associated with this wicked Babylon that the Bible's talking about. Look at Revelation 17, verse number 1. The Bible says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. There's that exact same phrase we saw from Revelation 14. And at first it talks about the kings of the earth, you know, getting in bed with, with the great whore. But not just the kings of these other nations, the inhabitants of all the earth. They're all involved. They're all eating up this, this, this wickedness that the great whore is spewing out. Verse number three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple in scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So you like how, how the, 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 the whore is all dressed up nice? And this is the way Satan makes sin look to us. It's, um, you know, the woman's arrayed in purple. And, and purple, the color purple is, is, is associated with like royalty, like a royal color, real expensive, lavish, right? Purple and scarlet and, uh, you know, decked with gold, precious stones, pearls, all these nice things to make, to make this whore, which is exactly what she is, a whore, look so beautiful and so attractive and everything else. And, and isn't it quaint? She's holding a cup in her hand. And what's in the cup? It says, full of a abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And see, this is the perspective we need to have about sin because that doesn't sound good, does it? When it's saying, yeah, the cup was full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. That is the way the Bible describes it because the Bible is the truth. But that's not the way you're going to hear it from the, from the world. The devil's trying to deceive you and trying to, trying to make this woman all prettied up and say, oh, wow, look at how fancy she is. Oh, look how good she looks. And to get everybody wrapped up into her sin and just to be deceived by it. The Bible tells us the truth. It says wickedness, it's filthiness, it's fornication. Verse number five, and upon her head was a name written, mystery. Look at this, Babylon the Great. So this is this, is this woman that we're talking about. Her name, it says there's a name written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, 
What an amazing statement. First of all, he's saying, the woman's drunken with the blood of the saints, which meaning that, that out of Babylon, out of this great whore, is going to be where all the persecutions are coming from against the saints, against the Christians, against the believers. And they're going to be putting them to death. And they're going to be putting so many Christians to death, it says she's drunken with the blood of the saints. And she's eating it up, and she's loving it. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And But the sight, though, he says, I wondered with great admiration. This is John speaking. This is John seeing this vision in Revelation. And he's just taken with this image. Which, to me, that's incredible. He knows that, that there's the blood of the city. He knows this is all wickedness going on. Yet he's still just wondering great admiration. That is how deceptive Babylon is going to be when the Antichrist comes. I mean, even, even a Christian is saying, like, wow, like, I just, this is, this is kind of an amazing thing. This is, you know, I'm wondering at this. And not just wondering, he's wondering with great admiration at such a sight, such a, you know, you could say a glorious sight, but it's wickedness, right? And this is the way Babylon is going to be, Babylon the great. And jump down to verse number 17, he says, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree this is talking about the kings and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. In verse number 18, this is key. And the woman which thou sawest, so the woman, that, this great whore that we're talking about, has got the names, mystery, Babylon the great. It says, the woman which thou sawest is that great city. So the woman that we're speaking about in Revelation 17 is the city. It is the city of Babylon. All the references of the woman, the great whore, it's referring to a city and nothing else. Sit down which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And this is, the city is going to be where the, where the power structure is established for the one world government that is soon to come. Now, uh, flip back, if you would, to, to uh, Genesis. It's important to understand because this is Babylon. This is the, the prophetic Babylon of, of the end times. And we're just reading about the beginnings of Babylon from the Tower of Babel. And... There's similarities that we can't overlook. One of the things that was a downfall of Babel in, in, in chapter 11 was, is found in verse number 4. It says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let us make us a name. It's the wicked imaginations of men that have this real proud, haughty, puffed up attitude of, of what we can do. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's make sure everybody knows that we were here. Let's make our mark and make a name for ourselves. And, um, and build this great tower that everyone will be able to see and we'll get all this glory and honor and everything else. And that is exact, the exact opposite attitude that we should have as Christians. It's not all about you. It's not all about us. It's about other people always. It's about making sure other people do well. But um, it's a wicked imagination. And um, Genesis 8, 21, if you remember this, the Bible said, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake after he sent the flood. For the imagination of man's heart is evil for you. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. The Bible says that, it's the imagination that is, that is evil from his youth. And why is it important? Verse number 6, verse number 6 of Genesis 11, the Bible says, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. It's their imagination. Their imagination is, hey, let's build this tower unto heaven. It's a wicked imagination. It's, a, it's, it's the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. And um, we ought to be careful, even as a nation here, that we don't just have this proud attitude. And this, is, this prevails in our society today. We have this, this proud American attitude that we are better than everybody else. And 
Most people say, well, why would we bear up? Well, because we could kick their butts. Because we've got this great military. We can inflict violence on other people, and we're so great, and we're going to tell everybody else the way that they need to run their lives and the way that they need to run their governments because we're so great. And people will just blindly stand behind our government and stand behind our military and say, well, yeah, USA, USA, we're going to go over there. We're going to kill those brown people. We're going to kill those black people. And I don't care because they're not Americans and they need to do things the way that we do things. And this is the attitude that people have, and it's wickedness. To just have this, this proud attitude thinking that we're so great. This nation is going to be destroyed by God. Mark those words. This nation has gone so far with the innocent children being murdered on a daily basis through abortion, with the, the, the sodomites being out and proud and marching up and down the streets, with the movies being produced and pumped out and influencing the entire globe. Are you kidding me? You think God's not going to judge this nation? And you think we're so great and that we ought to be going around and telling everyone else how to run their country? And these countries that we go to, oftentimes they'll have like better laws than we do on a, on a lot of things. I'm not saying that they're, you know, that I want to go live in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or one of these other places, but at least they know the difference between men and women. And that's a pretty basic thing. At least, you know, Russia and, and Putin is over there saying not, and again, look, I'm not a fan of any of these people in any of these countries. I'm not saying there's some great country. But I, what I'm saying is that at least He's outlawing the fags from adopting children, and you're not allowed to, to just be openly homo and, and have all of your, your rallies and stuff because he knows it's wicked and wrong. It's a real basic truth to, to grasp and to hold, and we are so against even the most basic things in our society, in our culture today. And you think that we're just, oh, well, but we're America. We're going to tell everyone else what to do. Wrong. Wrong attitude there. We have no business going in, in all these. America is just a big empire. That's all it is. And they try to sell it to the people. Say, oh, be scared. Be afraid. Some terrorist might come and blow up your town. And you need to live in fear all the time. And we need to go fight this war to protect you. It's a bunch of lies. It's a bunch of baloney. Uh, it's it's fun. Look up the statistics sometime on, on what the um, odds are of you actually being killed by a terrorist attack in the United States. Look up those odds. You're more likely to die from a bee sting. A bee sting. Yet we're going to spend billions and probably trillions at this point of money in a war, in another country, nothing to do with us, and just, just Bomb them. Who cares about the people? Who cares about the civilians? Who cares about everyone else? The collateral damage that gets in the way. And people are going to be proud about that. I'm not proud about that. Now, I know a lot of people get deceived into going and into serving the military, and I'm not against those people individually by any means, but the government's lying to you. These wars are not necessary and we need to, to mind our own business and get our act straight here at home and be a righteous nation for once instead of spewing out all this, this, this wine of the wrath of her fornication like, like the great whore does because America has become one big whore of a country. That's the state of, of the Union today. I don't know what the state Union dress is, but I just gave one today. That's the, that's the state that our country is in. And it's sad. And it's a shame. And that's why it's so much the more important for men of God, for saved people to, to not sit by silently while all this stuff goes on, but to voice your opinion, to make things known, to make the truth known and say, you know what? There are still some people today that believe in, in decency and that believe in God's laws and think that and, and reject all this world's um, wickedness and, and adultery and fornication and everything else. It's spewing out. And I'm going to be a righteous person and, and live the way that God has, has told us that we need to live. And you know what? God's able to, to protect his people and to save his people out of tribulations and out of hard times. And I believe that 100%. And we need to make sure that we're doing our part. I mean, the guard has been let down. 
And that's why things are getting the way they are. And the truth has not been has not been shouted loud enough from the housetops to try to stem off this this tide of wickedness that's going on in this country. Mama, Mama. Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before fall. People think that we're just this great superpower we can never be beat. This attitude that no one can ever beat us. We are just more powerful. Not true. Hey, if God is not for us, everyone can be against us. And you know what happens to the whore? The whore doesn't have anyone that actually loves her. The whore has a lot of people that use her. And for a time, things might be great and they're having their party and things are going along swell. But you know what? Everybody ends up hating the whore. Everybody does. And, and they're not going to care one lick about the whore. That's the way it is in real life. That's the way it is in reality. Whores that, that want to sleep around. And girls, listen up. Girls that, that want to go out and, and, and just lay with all bunch of different guys that they're not married to is wickedness. And that's called a whore. And that's someone that nobody ever loves. And that is always going to be treated rotten and treat, treated poorly. And you're never going to be respected. Because you just go ahead and, and just lay with any guy that you see or whatever. That's, um, and that's the way that you're going you're to be treated poorly as a result. And this country and any country that acts like a whore and spews out all of this wickedness and, and to its own shame is going to receive the recompense of their error. And, um, and, it's, and it's coming. And it's going to happen to this day. I, Pride goeth before destruction. When a, when a country's that proud and lifted up, God's going to say, guess what? You're not as tough as you think you are. Egypt was that way. Egypt thought they were unbeatable. Did Egypt, where's Egypt today? Are they still ruling the world? Nope. Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the same way. What did God do to Nebuchadnezzar? He made his heart like the heart of a beast. He was out eating grass, and his fingernails became like, like claws, and... And his hair became like feathers. And I mean, he was out for like seven years. He was just out in the wilderness, just eating, eating grass like an ox. God said, you didn't do this. I gave this to you. And you know what he did? He took it away, too. Most powerful nation in the whole world. That seems to be where we're sitting today. And we have this, this rotten, proud attitude. And, and for no good reason either, when, when the whole country's just behaving like a whore. And it's just all the filthiness is being promoted. But we're headed towards a one world government. I'm going to get back into the, into the sermon here, into the Genesis. It's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. You can see the signs of it. It started with, you know, the League of Nations and then the United Nations. And, and there's just more and more of the... Of the um, infrastructure being set up and, and the, you know, the, these nations working together. We're headed towards a one world government. The, the world is growing increasingly smaller. And ever since the American empire has, has continued to expand its reach into the entire country and just, and just really influence the whole world, most people now in other countries are learning to speak English. There's a lot of people that speak English. I mean, it's, English has become a second language is like the like like the global second language is English. And not just that, we also have now with the new technology so much more ability to communicate with each other. Just was it just was it this morning when I showed you that email in French that I had? Just this morning. I'm working. We're selling in marketplaces at my job overseas in France. And we get notifications on, on our account in French. So, I don't know French. I know some Spanish. I don't know French. I copy the text, put it in Google, write in English immediately. And if I want to respond, I type out in English, click a button, write back into French. This is where we're at today. And, and that's... For free, and that's just just available to anyone with a computer and the internet. You can do that for free. Now, obviously, there's you know uh, 
it won't be long, and they even have this too, where people will be able to translate, and um, I even have a speech recognition software that can, that can take what you say and transcribe it and do all kinds of things. And I'm, the point is, with this technology and with people all learning English, we're getting to this point to where Babel was at, except this is on a global scale. See, at the time, it was just one city, because that's all the people that were out in the world at the time. That was the whole world, one world government, was, was all found in Babel. But now we're headed towards one world government, and we're all speaking the same language. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we're starting to see such an advance in technology you got so many people working together. But is it working together for good? No. Not when you have, by and large, unsaved man working together and trying to do things out of the imagination of their heart. We saw in Babel, out of the imagination of their heart, what they do, they tried to build a, a tower into heaven. You might say, oh, well, that's just silly, that's just stupid, you can't build a tower into heaven. What do we have today? We have people, and, and it's interesting, when, when you, if, you, if you just take a step back and, and try to see an overview of the, way, of the way our modern history has been going, just in this country alone, all the forces that have been at work simultaneously to impact and influence people's minds and the way you think about things and the way you view things, whether it be sin, whether it be all, a whole host of different, uh, different things, our attitudes and minds have changed drastically in a very short period of time. And one of, one of the things was with evolution, evolution being taught as a fact, the, 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 this teaching that, that we evolved out of apes and, and they all came from, you know, it all came down to this, this one single cell organism and, you know, and, and, and creatures and animals all started becoming better and more complicated, and more advanced, and now we're like at the, at the top of, of the most advanced being, but people have this mindset and they've been taught this, as I was taught this from a, from a child, that evolution is true and that we're continuing to evolve, right? And it's wickedness, just as Darwin's book, you know, The Origin of the Species, that's not the entire title, and the entire title is just completely out of my, out of my brain right now, when he talks about the, the um, advancement of the, of, uh, do you know what, do you, you know the whole title of this book? That's a, the, you know, people refer to the origin of the species because they drop off the rest of the title because it's basically talking about um, races, the, uh, races being better than others. You know, so like you say, oh, well, the white race, they're better than the black race or better than the, than the Hispanic race or whatever. Like they'll start to say that because we've evolved, and hey, if, you, if evolution's true, that would make sense, wouldn't it? That at least, you know, someone might be higher, some people are higher on the evolutionary scale than others. <laughs> hey, the internet's up. Cool. <laughs> On the origin of species by means of natural selection. No, yeah, there's more to it than that. It's still not even the whole thing. That's not the whole thing? No. There's more to it than just natural selection. But anyways, um, it's fine. <laughs> it's this way of thinking that makes people think we're going to continue evolving. We're going to keep getting better and better. And this is where, to some people today, are buying into this transhumanism. And if you're not familiar with that, it's where people believe that they are going to achieve immortality and live forever by merging man with machine. And when you look at the, the technology with computers these days and what they're capable of doing, I'll tell you this, I believe that that may even be possible if man was given enough time to work all these things out and, and to come, I, I think that that might even be attainable. I, I think that might be possible, but I'll tell you what, it will never happen because God won't let it happen. He'll step in and make sure he's not going to allow that to happen, but the acceleration of technology to, to be able to, be able to comprehend now, <coughs> we're able to, to see how the end times could even play out. I mean, you think about like the mark of the beast, you think about these other things that, 
before, like how could somebody not buy or sell? Like how could you really restrict people not from buying and selling? Because there's always a black market, right? Like how could you rest restrict people from buying and selling? Well, with the technology these days, you can see how they could force people to not be able to have access to any any type of credit, currency, and you know whatever without taking a mark. And you can see how that could be implemented these days. Now, we don't know exactly how it's going to be, but you can at least see the way things are today, things that, you know, 100 years ago, you have no idea how that could be played out and how that could really be enforced and how you could track down and kill all the Christians. But um, there's a lot of dangerous technologies being developed now because it's in the imagination of man's heart. And the reason why I think that man might even possibly be able to do something like that is because of what God said in Genesis 11, verse 6. He said at the, at the end of the verse, and now he will, I'll read the whole verse. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God's saying they're able to do this. Nothing's going to be restrained. He said, they're all working together. They're all doing this stuff. He's like, I need, I need to fix this. Because they'll be able to do whatever their wicked hearts imagine. Kind of incredible. I mean, God's given us a wonderful mind, wonderful skills to be able to do lots of cool things. And and and, but when mankind just just joins together as all one language and 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 starts working for one purpose, it's it's never going to be a good thing. I think about the dangerous technologies that are being developed today. There's um, they have these GMO foods where they're genetically modifying. Um, I mean, they're going in and tampering with DNA structure, with, you know, with all this different stuff on foods. They're doing cloning. There's experiments no. with mind control. You think of like MK Ultra and, and, and being able to get in, it, like scientifically get into people's heads and to make them, to kind of split, split up their personality, make them you know, schizophrenic and be able to do these different things and be programmed to do these certain things. I mean, this is, this is all... This is all stuff that the government's been into, not, you know, but not just the government. I mean, this is, this is what's going on today. This is what people are looking into doing. Um, surveillance equipment. It amazes me. Do you know, like, how tiny microphones can pick up and draw? And the Zoom capabilities and just being able to, to see. I, I've heard so many stories of people who involved projects that are not able, not really allowed to say anything, but like from a satellite in the sky or from an airplane to be able to, to hone in on like a license plate. And that's old technology. That's something that's not so classified they can't say anything about. But this, and, and then with even the, the weather modification, geoengineering, they're, they're trying to to do all kinds of that. That's why we see all the chemtrails up in the sky. They're dumping these pollutants into the air, and they're trying. They literally think they're going to be able to reflect some of the sun wave, sun rays, to stop the global warming from that hoax that's going on. And there's the the harp system up in Alaska that they're using to try to modify where. And they did this back in um, in Vietnam. It's declassified that they were using this. They were seeding clouds to get it to rain. And because the monsoons were terrible there, if they could get it to rain over where the enemy was, yeah. that's going to ruin their supply line. It's going to you know, get them uh, in, in a worse condition to fight, and it's going to give you the advantage over them. The government did this back in Vietnam. You think it's not still going on today? But think about now all these things I just mentioned, these technologies. When you take a step back, it's trying to get us more like God. Think about God's all-knowing, right? Look at the surveillance, the mind control, and just being able to listen in on everything that people say and watch everything that a person does. God does that. Yet we're trying to, to, to come up with all this stuff to do the same thing. All-powerful with, with being able to control the weather. I mean, God's the one who, who, all throughout the Bible, is the one who's known for bringing you know, the, the, the rain and the seed time and the harvest and he's the one that can control the famines and the pestilence and when these things happen, and man's trying to take that over. And um, all-powerful, even with the high-tech weaponry. You know, being able to mobilize people using 
different types of rays and radiation and different, you know, all microwaves and all kinds of different things are out there now um, to be able to, to exert control over people. And then, and this is the weird one, even being everywhere at once is something that, that God is, right? But by being able to plug themselves into this, this matrix type of computer world and to become part of this whole collective um, consciousness, these are things that, that it's easy to laugh at them. It's easy to blow it off and say that's science fiction. People are really working hard on these things. And a lot of them are already in place. I mean, I'm, I'm just listening. This, this is all stuff that was off the top of my head that I kind of wrote down here that I know is, is being worked on. It's, it's open. It's public. These things are being worked on. And this is where the, the imagination of man's heart is wicked. And as we grow as a society and become all the one language and we're all able to work together and do all these things, nothing is going to be restrained from them, is what God said. And that's another reason why I think the end is very soon. Because all these things, you know, not all of them, but you know, some of these, these extreme technologies that people are working on, God's not going to allow that. God's not going to allow you to have eternal life through any other means but through Jesus Christ. He's not going to allow it to happen. It can't happen. It won't happen. But people are working towards that. Everything is going to culminate when the Antichrist, um, with the Antichrist and him coming in and setting up the one world government, obviously, then we'll know for sure the times are at hand when we see the abomination uh, that make it desolate, set up where it ought not to be, you know, saying um, that he is God, standing in the temple, proclaiming it to be God. And that's when God's going to step in, just as he did, we, we see here, with the Tower of Babel. Um, so God's solution here, let's go back to Genesis 11. I'm not going to be able to get in, okay. There's a, lot, there's a lot to look at. And go back and read this story again with, with the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And it, it's not, not a whole lot of stuff there, but there's so much that, that, that is pertinent and can still be applied for future events. Um, Genesis 11. So we see God's solution, right? When God steps in at the Tower of Babel, this is another one, the last, probably the last major point I want to make for the sermon tonight. He confounds the people by making them speak different languages, right? So they can't understand each other. This is how he stops their great work of everyone working together. He says, okay, now good luck with that. And people are walking around trying to talk to each other, and they're all speaking these different languages. So what do they do? They group themselves by who can understand each other, who are speaking the same languages, and they start forming their nations. And they separate. Here's a nation, here's a nation, here's a nation after their own tongue, after the way that they speak. And um, verse number 7 says, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. <laughs> Therefore is the name of it called Babel. And you think of like, like a baby's babbling or something like that. That's where the word comes from. It comes from Babel. Because that's where people were just talking and not able to understand each other. God confounded their language. And he says, because the Lord did their confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So why is this important? It's really important for a couple of reasons. God has always wanted there to be multiple nations. God does not want us to have a one world government. He does not want us to all be joined together. He wants you to be able to go, I mean, part of your free will, you ought to be able to do, you know, to... to Go and, and be, join yourself to be a part of another nation that lines up with what you think. Just like uh, the heathen nations, people that lived in these other nations, they were allowed to come and join themselves under the nation of Israel. They could immigrate. They can, they could, if they believed God, they could come and, and become a part of that nation. He was, God was all for that, but he still wanted to have separate nations. He didn't want to have just one kingdom ruling over everybody. Um, but the other reason why this is so important is that we see God's the one that created these languages. Man didn't come up with all these different languages. God did. And there's some people that think that God's word is bound to just like two or three languages. They'll say, well, if you want to understand the Bible, you got to just know Greek and Hebrew. And a little bit of Aramaic. 
then, then you can get the true understanding behind God's word. I don't buy that for a second. God created all these different languages. He didn't create one language. He didn't say, well, I want to communicate with my people and it has to be through this language. Why would he do that? I mean, think about... Um, God promised to preserve his word. We see that in Psalms. God created different languages in the Tower of Babel. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need God. We need to be able to hear God's word and understand it in order to be saved. So the logic would be, okay, if you, could, if you can't really get the full meaning of God's word unless you read the Hebrew or unless you read the Greek, then that would mean we would all have to learn Hebrew and Greek in order to get saved. And that's ridiculous. It's foolishness. Of course God didn't make it like that. He didn't automatically damn everyone in the world except for one group of people that were the only ones who were truly capable of understanding his words. It's not the way it works. Also, think about this. He confounded their language on purpose because it wasn't good for them to all have one language because they started doing wickedness and wicked things. For their own benefit, he confounded their language. And... It's not good for us to all speak one language either. There ought to be separate nations. We ought to be able to just do our own things and not all um, gather together. Do you think God wants everyone in the world today to speak Hebrew? If he did, he wouldn't have confounded the languages. And for, we don't even know what, the, what that original language was of Noah and, and his sons off the ark. We don't know what language they spoke. How do you know it was Hebrew? It doesn't say Hebrew wasn't written, you know, Moses was the one who wrote down the books of the Old Testament. They could have been speaking any other language. Take your pick. I mean, the odds are one in whatever, however many languages were. Moses wrote it down, um, you know, hundreds of years later. So, um, If we can't, you know, and, and the, the way of thinking is kind of going, if we can't truly understand the Bible unless we know Hebrew, then why wouldn't God want, doesn't God want us to know his word? I mean, he's able to preserve his word because he's, he created the languages. He could make his word um, go into all languages and into all the ends of the earth. And that is evident. And um, let's, uh, we're going to finish up the chapter here. Look, jump down to verse number 28 of Genesis 11. We're not going to go through all the genealogy. Um, I think I covered quite a bit of the genealogy. Put your hand down. Genesis eleven twenty eight. It says, and Her so well, I'll go up a little bit before that. Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So now we get to see kind of the, the, the family of Abraham. And of course, he's called Abram in this chapter. He's going to get his name changed later on. But now we're going to spend the next multiple chapters just dealing with all these stories about Abraham. And um, Abraham, of course, is a huge figure in the Bible. Lots of stuff to be learned here. But we see his family tree here. So it says that um, Terah is Abraham's father. And Abraham as um, Nahor and Haran were his brothers. And Haran begat Lot. So Lot is Abraham's nephew. It's his brother's son. Right? But then it says in verse 28, And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, um, so, and that's when Lot joins himself to Abraham's family. You know, Abraham takes care of him kind of like his own son, but it's his nephew. But um, what's interesting here is that Ur... It says Ur of the Chaldees. Now, the Chaldeans later, they basically become synonymous with the Babylonians. When you think of the Babylonian Empire, all throughout the Bible you see, it's referred to as the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. It's the same thing, and the Bible uses them synonymously. But, I mean, technically, they weren't necessarily exactly the same thing. Um, Ur, the city of Ur, was kind of southeast of Babylon. You had Babylon, Ur was, was southeast. This way. I got, a, I got a mirror from what I'm thinking in my head. But, um, and just like Babylon is the city, the Chaldeans were more of like a people. 
or a region, you know, an area that, that had the Chaldeans, and, and Babylon was one city. But um, the Bible uses them synonymously. But we see here that the, the, the nativity where, t where um, Haran was born was in the land of the Chaldeans. And um, you think about the wickedness of Babylon and the Chaldeans and everything else. Um, Abraham was probably born there as well. I mean, he was definitely born in the region. And God called um, Abraham out of that land. Out from the, the land of his nativity, out from those gods and the and the things that you know and the, and, the, and um, who they worship, and he let, and he called him out of that land into the promised land. And this is again very symbolic, not only of our salvation, right? God calls us out of this world to to you know put our faith in, in Christ, stop believing in whatever it is that the world has for you to offer, that the heathen will have for you to believe in and for your faith in the true God, but not just for our salvation, but also for our spiritual walk. You know, God calls us out of the heathen land. In this case, it is the land of the Chaldeans. God, God called Abraham and said, you know, I want you out of there. I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm going to give you this inheritance. And that was a promise made to Abraham. And this is the promise that we have today. We have a promise, one, of, um, of our salvation and inheritance in heaven for us. But also, with our walk with God, he wants us to not walk as the world walks, not to be a part of this world. We need to be different. We're a peculiar people. And we, need, we ought to be separate from the world. And um, we're going to get into the last, the real interesting thing, I'm going to save it for next week because I just simply don't think I have enough time to really fully expound what I want to expound here um, with Abraham's father. But let's just read the rest of the chapter, and we'll close. Um, so we see that, that Lot is Abraham's nephew. Verse number 28, And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of the nativ his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Verse 29, And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ixah. So here we see that Nahor marries his niece. Now, this is prior to the Mosaic Law. This is prior to God putting on those restrictions of how close of a, of a relative you're allowed to marry. Um, and obviously, you know, after getting off the ark, there's not a whole lot of pickings for people to get married and to start families because this started with just, you know, those three families of Noah's sons. So, um... It's not until later where God's saying, okay, you know, this is, we're, we're not going to, um, you're not allowed to do this when it's when it's that close of a relation. But I mean, think about even with Adam and Eve, the brothers and sisters had to be getting married. When you start with two people, you, you, had, you had to do it that way. Now, I think that um, the reason why they were able to do that and it was fine is because when Adam and Eve were created... They had a, their DNA was, was perfect. They had, they had everything. All the DNA. I believe that they had the DNA of, of all of the um, possibilities. Like today we have, because I, I was just talking to someone else about this. They asked me about, well, why are there, you know, if, if everyone came from Adam and Eve, why do we have black people and brown people, you know, and they have different characteristics, you know, with, with their hair and and there's sweat glands, and there's all these different things, right? Why, why is it so different? Well, part of what I believe is that, you know, when, when God created the DNA of Adam and Eve, they had, like, every, we have dominant and recessive traits, right? And anyone who knows a little bit about breeding knows that you can breed certain traits to become more dominant. And as people interbreed, in a, in a, you know, as they separate, and we get separated in nations and start interbreeding, certain traits are going to be more pronounced, and they're going to come out. And um, I very simply, I think that's where all the, the, the races came from on the earth, is, is, is from this, this, these lines of breeding where certain traits were um, magnified and, um, and came out. And obviously now we're at the point where there are, you're going to experience uh, physical problems, genetic mutations and things like that when you have, you know, a case of incest, 
and a child is born, that child is typically born with lots of abnormalities and, and problems because as a result of that too close of breeding between people. And, and I think it's just because we've gotten farther and farther and farther and farther and farther away, you know, it's so far away from when Adam and Eve were created. Hey, and it's all part of God's perfect plan in the way that he created the DNA and the way that everything works out. But um, so anyways, let's just finish up here because that's that was Nahor married his niece, Milka, which was Haran's daughter. And then verse 30, but Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai's daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. So the whole family is traveling into Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So they didn't make it into Canaan, they dwell in Haran. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Uh, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for these words. God, we, we pray that you would please continue to increase our knowledge as we, as we rapidly seem to be approaching the end of days. And uh, we pray that you would please just give us more wisdom and understanding. And uh, Lord, help us to be lights that shine in this dark world. We, we live in a, in a Babylon, so to speak, dear Lord. We live in a, in a decadent society and, a, and in a culture that is just completely and increasingly rejecting you more and more and turning more and more into their own sin. And they're also uh, just, just publicizing it and trying to infect the entire world with, uh, with these wicked thoughts and imaginations of their heart, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to stem the tide. Lord, uh, protect us from evil. And just continue to increase our knowledge and understanding of the things that we need to be doing as the day approaches us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.